So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some of the, we'll start talking about some of the basic Java completable future features. And uh, that'll get us probably through the first 20 minutes or so. And then we'll discuss the advanced features. And uh, not surprisingly, the advanced features are what you'll need in order to be able to do the next programming assignment, the one that's due after the one that's due shortly. Uh, I should also remind everybody there'll be a quiz on Wednesday, which will cover everything that we have talked about since the last quiz about a month ago or so. So we'll first start by talking about some of the basic completable future features. I've given you a real high-level overview of this stuff. Now we're going to dive into more detail about the various capabilities that they provide. And I'll show you lots of examples, as always. So the example we'll be looking at here is in the EX8 folder in my GitHub account. And this example is similar to ones you've seen before. We'll just be using some of the basic features. And then I'll talk later about some of the more advanced features. And we'll revisit the example. And you can see how it uses the advanced features to better effect. So you have even less dependency on low-level things like threads and other mechanisms that you'd kind of like to hide if you possibly could. As we talked about before, completable future implements the future API. So remember, we had Java Futures, which was from the Java 5 version, about 2004 timeframe. And they gave you very, very simple capabilities to essentially uh, cancel a future, check if it's canceled, check if it's done, and then get the results when the asynchronous computation is finished. Here's just a quick recap of what the basic features can do. So if you recall, you can uh, submit some long-running operation. That'll run in the background. In this case, we're using the common fork join pool. We're submitting this asynchronous computation. We get back a fork join task, which is a future, so you can wait on it. And this particular example is just showing how you can block to get the result. And you could either get it with an indefinite block, or you could also do a timed block as well as a polling block, where it doesn't block at all, really. It just checks to see if the result is there. So that's a very simple feature. That's essentially the same as you would get with a regular, regular future. You can also check to see if the future's finished. You can cancel it. If it's not finished, if it has been canceled, of course, you wouldn't want to cancel it. But you can do all these sort of low-level mechanisms to see if the future is uh, connected to something that's still going on. As a little side note, I won't dwell on this. If you want to learn more, take a look at the link down here. For some rather odd reason, cancel for completable futures actually does not interrupt the asynchronously running computation. That will still keep running. All you'll do is just say, I don't care to ever get the result, which tells the future, yeah, just ignore the result when it's done. This article here explains why that's the case. It's kind of goofy, but um, it's a little non-intuitive. So it doesn't quite work the way you might think. Another thing that the basic features in completable futures do is they define something called a join method. And if you recall, get was the classic way you would get the result back when an asynchronous computation finished. The downside with get was it used something called checked exceptions. So you had to put these exception try-catch blocks in your code or put them in your method signature as a throw spec in order to be able to handle the checked exception. And that gets really awkward. So join behaves like get except it doesn't use checked exceptions. It uses so-called runtime exceptions. And runtime exceptions are nice because you don't have to syntactically clutter your code with try-catch blocks to catch a runtime exception. Now, of course, if something goes wrong, you still have to make sure you handle it somehow. So it's not like you've gotten off the hook from dealing with error conditions. But the good news is you don't have to clutter your code. Why did they do this, and why does it matter? If you don't have runtime exceptions, I'm sorry, if you don't have checked exceptions, but you have runtime exceptions, then you can use these mechanisms in Java 8 streams as method references or simple Lambda expressions. And the code is very, very concise and easy to understand at a, at a single glance. So for example, this particular little code snippet takes a list of futures, turns it into a stream, joins all the futures using the map call with future colon colon join. And then it takes the results of all the join futures and collects those results into a list. So that's nice and concise and easy to understand. And you can see it's a method reference. Conversely, here's what the code would look like if we had to use the get API. So with get, it's a checked exception. So we would have to kind of clutter our code by putting a try catch block 
inside of the map call, which as you can see is, is doable, but wow, is it ugly. So this is just a lot more cumbersome to try to wrap these try-catch blocks. Way better to use the runtime version, which doesn't require cluttering the code with a try-catch block. So it's just a lot cleaner and more concise. There's other ways around this using something called exception laundering. I won't go into that right now. We'll talk about that later. One other thing you can do with the simple parts of uh, completable futures is you can use something that's called a completion method. You can explicitly complete a future. There's a method called complete where you give it the return result or the result of the future computation. And the typical reason for doing this is to be able to write code where you want to do some asynchronous computation. And when that asynchronous computation is done, you want to explicitly tell the future, here is your final result. And anybody who's waiting for that future to complete will then be able to continue on their merry way after we complete with this call. So I'll show you some more examples of this that makes it a little bit more clear shortly. But imagine you create a completable future that is not associated with any computation. And then you spawn a thread, or you do supply async. You somehow get things to run asynchronously. And then after the asynchronous computation is finished, let's say you multiply big fractions together or something, you can then tell the future, I'm done. And that will go ahead and let anybody who's waiting for the future to be finished to continue on at that point. So after complete is called, then calls to join will unblock or never have to block in the first place if you haven't called them yet. There's a real interesting little idiom that I've used, and you'll see this when we talk about some of the more detailed examples here shortly, where you can actually create a, um, a value. In this case, it's a completable future that's given a completed value. So this is actually going to be computed ahead of time. So we're going to say um, completable future dot completed future and we're going to give it a zero result. And we're going to store this in something that has the result zero, or the, the name zero. So this is a completable future that has the value of zero. It's already been finished. So it's like a constant that already has a value that's been assigned to it. Why the heck would you ever want to do this? Well, it turns out to be handy in some cases where you need to be able to use essentially future constants without having to call this code over and over again. So here we could do something where we're going to Maybe has some error condition where something goes wrong, and we're going to set the result of this to 0. So when you say 0.join on a completable future that's been set to a completed value, that will just always return right away. So you can essentially treat this as a constant. It may not be entirely clear why this is a win at the moment, but I'll show you some examples here shortly where setting these things up make return values real simple for the default case where the result is 0. OK, so that's the end of the first part of the overview of completable futures that are the basic features. Again, not too complicated, very much like the ones you get out of the box with Java futures with ever so much tiny little tweaks to improve the exception handling and a couple of other uh, odd features that, that make things easier to program.